Uh, a very good, extremely late afternoon for you. And I'm here to torture your way into the dinner. Now, let me begin by saying that I offered Michael four different topics to talk about. Three of them were very well-defined, small, concise, and he chose the one that is the biggest. Uh, and therefore, I will probably be talking here at midnight. I don't know where you're going to be. Uh, but the, uh, and this is, uh, what happens here is the, the Betrayal of Liberal Economics is the title of the book I've published about three years ago. Um, and it's a very long book. It's two volumes, 800 pages. So uh, I, th I thought actually to have a reading of it uh, tonight. But, uh, <laughs> but inste <laughs> instead, I just picked very few topics or very few issues to try and give you some flavor of the argument, although the uh, arguments are uh, larger and uh, more complex. In any case, a lot of it ties, like a uh, Alan's confession earlier today, I came late to uh, recognize Karl Mittermeier. Um, and um, I was astonished to discover how much I agree with him in the sense of the need to, as someone said early in the morning, to change the paradigm, to change the framework of economic analysis. Uh, I also agreed with him on the distinction between what he called dogmatic and practical, although I'm not sure that I would have necessarily agreed with what he means by this. And also, I agreed with him completely that the reading of Adam Smith by contemporary economists and even philosophers, I must say, is very, very false. And uh, there's a need to reread it. And not only to reread it, I think that it actually has the seeds of the paradigm that need to replace the modern one. I'm not saying that Smith theory, for instance, is a ready-made theory for us to use now, but I think that the analytical framework that he offers us is the one that is relevant and is a good substitute to uh, modern economics. Um, so, uh, I shall start, therefore, with uh, slightly a matter of context. A lot of things people said today sort of uh, chime with what I'm, uh, I want to say. And, uh, but I think that, so when we are all, we're all very happy to, to uh, attack modern economics and new liberals and all these ideas, people who want to have, uh, let, this, let the invisible hand do what it wants and let people achieve things. But we keep forgetting where this came from. And when, what does it mean actually to want to replace it? Well. It came from the enlighten early Enlightenment with a very big desire to emulate. So first of all, the Enlightenment is characterized by a phenomenal shift in our understanding of the world, from a world in which everything is explained due to some kind of a divine design into a world in which have to be somewhat self-regulated, not necessarily replacing the divine, as Newton famously said, you know, he's just discovering the beauty of God's creation. He wasn't replacing God. So the desire to find kind of an endogenous explanation to social analysis was very, very powerful. And this idea of looking for a self-regulated system is the essence of this kind of attempt to have a world without God, so to speak. Which also, the problem is that it does not only include, the, it does not include only the organization of economic activities. It also includes the endogenization of ethics and sociality. And that means that if you look at this question of natural liberty, as it were, which is what this term actually means, and none of you use it, but what economists are talking about, this kind of self-regulating uh, system, this term is, used to, is known as natural liberty. But no one likes to stay, come up and say, I hate natural liberty. That doesn't sound very uh, persuasive. But there are good reasons to say this, and I shall say it in a minute. But that doesn't mean that should not be conflated with not wanting to be liberal. So there are a lot of issues have to do with what liberalism means and whether natural liberty is actually the legitimate son or daughter of uh, liberalism. This is a subject, by the way, I'm writing in my next book, so you shall have to wait for, it, for this, which is a continuation of this book about the betrayal of liberal economics. But... So what is this search for a self-regulating system? Well, the first of all was, of course, Hobbes, who 
He abstracted, Alan. You have to abstract. But the fact that you abstract does not mean that you don't recognize heterogeneity. Abstraction, the problem with economics abstraction is not that there is an abstraction. It's the nature of the abstraction. At the end of the day, you know, uh, some, I, a lot of time I tell students, you know, sometimes the average height of people is something that no one is at. No one is average height. Yet average height is a very useful information to building rooms. If you don't have any idea about average height or something about distribution, you will not build a room. So abstraction in itself is not, is not a, a dirty word. Is the question is, what is this that abstraction? And, which is very important, an abstraction has to be relevant. There is a term, which I think I invented, this is in my book, which I call relevant abstraction. So when you abstract from something, you do have to ask yourself the question, how does the actual world relate to my abstraction? So this is not a criticism of the criticism. I agree with you that the way economics abstracts is terrible. But it's a, it's a criticism of those people who want to get away from abstractions altogether. So Hobbes was first to abstract. He, because he was trying to understand the world, and he created this kind of a uh, terrible human being, and he reached the conclusion he reached. Of course, Hobbes, no natural liberty. People are so awful, let, let them have someone to run them, and that will be the, the end of it. In the middle, between Hobbes and Locke, came Spinoza. Now, Spinoza is an interesting character. I will not spend a lot of time with it because we, have, we don't have the time. Uh, it's very interesting because there is a very eminent philosopher, Jonathan Israel, who is in Princeton, who wrote two books to make very large books, a thousand pages each, to make the claim that Spinoza is actually the real true liberal. Why? Because he believed in equality. Now, I cannot begin to say how, how wrong this is in terms of understanding of Spinoza. But Spinoza was certainly the one who he did believe that each individual has a universal part in it and a particular part in it. But he also is the one who conceived, not in his book on ethics, but in his other writings, the idea of a secular religion. And what he meant by this, he meant he talked about different levels of understanding. And he said, not everybody, heterogeneity, will be able to understand things in the same way. And therefore, we have to create, I'm sort of paraphrasing, and don't quote me on this, uh, any sort of, we have to uh, some kind create some kind of a secular religion that will be created by the people who are able of the kind of understanding that is right, that will persuade those who are not able to understand it to follow the actual rule of how society should be organized. So again, not natural liberty. So of course, the only one who came up with natural liberty was Locke. But Locke is also a very funny story. Uh, Locke uh, looked at people and said, no, he's, he's wrong, helps. Of course, people are, are good people. They, and there is, and in the state of nature, he argued, there is natural liberty. So one asked, why do people want to get into society altogether? There are two types of answer attributed to, to, uh, to uh, Locke. One more problematic, in which they say, well, Although things are okay in the state of nature, they're a bit precarious. So people want some kind of a certainty, but that's a Hobbesian argument. So if they do want, if the situation is precarious, you need to forego some of your liberties or some of the natural rights. The, but the other reason, which is more dominant in Locke, is they want to go into society because they, have, they want to have something they do not have in the state of nature. Some spirit that something that comes only from the existence within society. In his case, being a true Christian, it was what he called the covenant of faith. He said, in the world, in the natural state, we have a covenant of deeds. If we want to have something more, we need a covenant of faith. So people actually have a particular purpose coming to society. And of course, the presumption of Locke was we can preserve the natural liberty because what they want is not a great deal, doesn't require any giving up of any kind of natural rights. The only problem is that what Locke considered the state of nature was not a state of nature. Why? It was a state of religious devotion. He believed that people are devout Christians, and that means that therefore they are all behaving well, and why are the natural rights? What is a right philosophically? A right philosophically is something you, have, you can claim from others to perform for you, and you have means to punish. In the natural state, who will do that? Ah, God. 
So the natural rights emanate from the fact that if you do something wrong, you'll be punished in your afterlife. So even Locke's notion of, natural, of the natural state, the natural liberty, is not really a state of natural liberty. It is, in a sense, if we come back to Karl Mittermeier, this is his hand behind the invisible hand. It is this the fact, well, all of that is pious. Yeah, of course, natural liberty is okay. It, okay. Uh, sorry, I haven't yet begun my talk, but... Uh, uh, so the, once, of course, this idea started with the, uh, once this, oh, I'll have to stand. I don't like standing in one place. Okay. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. All right. I'll stand. So once this idea of, do you mind if I walk a little bit? No, no, no. I don't. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so if, once this, uh, this the, the notion that we need to have a way in which we can, uh, organized society without a divine uh, rule came about, the first person to realize that it's a problem was Mandeville. Mandeville, in his 1714 uh, uh, Fame of the Bees, was the first one to say, look, if you let, you know, it's Mandeville, right? if you let people do what they, if you, if you want, if people want to achieve great uh, uh, wealth, material well-being, it means they have to behave in a way which is morally repugnant. And the question that arises, just a minute, what do you mean morally repugnant? For where is this morality? Because after all, if people want to achieve material well-being, and if, you, if society thinks that material well-being is a good thing to achieve, those properties that lead to material well-being are good. They're not wrong. So obviously, he makes a distinction between something which Adam Smith later talks about is the distinction between the nature of things and the nature of humans. And that's not human nature. Because what he talks about in terms of nature of humans is mainly the cognitive abilities of individuals. And he then says, there has always been a tension between the two. It has to, in the sense that what nature of things want, if you wish, evolutionary principle, and what humans <coughs> want are not the same thing, and therefore there is the idea of natural liberty already suggests that there will be a war between these two things. And the one who have captured this best was Adam Smith. Now, of course, uh, the way people like to think of it, they say, oh, the people who re read Adam Smith wrongly, they say, oh, yes, Adam Smith solved the problem. He, how did he so of Mandeville. How did he solve the problem? Because what Mandeville calls uh, private vice or selfish behavior, he said, no, 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 it's not selfish, it's self-interest, it's something which we call prudence. So it's a very moderate way in which you care for yourself, which is a natural thing. There's nothing wrong with it. That's what they claim, Adam Smith have said. And then they also say that he has actually p proven uh, Locke's uh, ideas, because in Locke's story, there's one thing I missed to tell you. So Locke was very concerned about preserving the rights we have in the state of nature when we move to the social stage, which is a natural liberty state emulating the state of nature. But he failed to ask the question, do we actually get from society that which we wanted? So we wanted to achieve something, we get to society, we have natural liberty, do we actually get from society what we wanted? He hasn't answered this. And people claim that here came Smith and says, well, we wanted material being, we don't have to be evil, we can be just prudent, and we, by allowing things to natural uh, progression of things, we can actually get them. So that actually seals the deal. Natural liberty is fine. Of course, add to this Mill apparent support of it, of course, which it isn't, uh, namely the fact that Mill was considered utilitarian, which he wasn't. And Mill was also the father of liberty. And of course, he cannot be utilitarian and the father of liberty at the same time, but let's leave it aside. And he, uh, therefore, is considered, therefore, he sealed the deal that not only this Lockean story is good, it's completely consistent with utility and with everything else, and what a wonderful world we live in. And modern economics, of course, sees itself as an ultimate progression, a linear progression, as some would say, from the classical economics to neoclassical economics, and there's nothing furthest from the truth than that. The classical economics is a very different framework of analysis from modern economics. 
And therefore, as I will try to persuade, well, not here, but if you follow me afterwards, I'll try to persuade you it's actually the right way to follow. Now, why is it the right way to follow? I'll explain in a minute. So the issue is that how, did mod how does modern economics find deals with this question of social and economic organization? Uh, what I call it complete decentralization, not to use the word natural liberty. How do they find, because they don't say anything about liberty, how do they find it work? Well, they say, we found a solution. Economics, why is it so hot in here? Economics is uh, uh, both universal and ethically neutral. By making it universal and ethically neutral, it seems like a physics theory of nature, and therefore it should be applied everywhere. And in a sense, this is the re reason why people can pursue globalization. It doesn't matter cultural differences. It ma doesn't matter cultural histories or uh, natural uh, his local histories. It doesn't matter. The system of decentral decision making, this apparently divisible hand, that works everywhere without fail. Uh, so, but if you actually look into the question, what is a social order? Social order requires basic, because of this distinction between of nature of things and nature of human, social order requires two types of order. One which I call a synchronic order, which is actually the compatibility of indi the contemporary compatibility, con contemporary compatibility of individual interactions. And the other diachronic order is that people actually think that this is good, and therefore we do nothing to alter it. Because if you have a situation which is compatible, as oh, this is terrible, then there will be people who will be trying to, to change it, and therefore will create a different dynamic into this. Now, in economics, general equilibrium offers basically the proof of a synchronic order. And again, just a comment on things we heard earlier. Uh, I'm, yeah, the way I understand uh, the, the way economics understand general equilibrium is not as a description of the world. General equilibrium is a logical test to, a, to something that people think it works. They say, well, we have this idea of decentralization. Will it work? It's at the logical limit. But of course, even for something to be a logical limit, you have to demonstrate that there is some kind of a conversion process to it. And uh, what I show in the book, and I will not show here, that modern economics has no sort of conversion and no means to evaluate the process of change. So we, 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 not only that there is no conversion, we could say, well, maybe at least we become better off. We, even this, we can't consistently prop, uh, do. That's, that's, in my book, the first part, which is the, uh, what I call the eco way economics betrayed us. Apart from the fact, of course, which I will mention briefly, that uh, economics, of course, doesn't deliver because general equilibrium actually does not deliver what people expect from it in society, and I'll say something about it in a second. Now, the diachronic order oh, is, is presumed by modern economics through uh, the ethical neutrality, which is embedded in this idea of the second welfare theorem. You talk about the first one. The second welfare theorem, which says, well, whatever society may wish, it can achieve by competitive means. So competition is above what society wishes. Ah, but the problem is, that what society wish has to be efficient. Why? No answer to this. And secondly, all ethical uh, judgments have to be consequentialist. From where is this coming from? What about the relationship between the initial position and the final thing? What happens in between? Uh, do we not have any judgment on that? So the presumption as if the second welfare theorem gives us the notion of ethical neutrality it's only true in a world in which ethics is a very short, very narrow uh, domain. But of course it isn't, and therefore it is not really a diachronic order. Now, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so, <clears throat> so there was another thing which was actually here is that we, we do keep, in spite of this kind of belief in the power of economics, we do keep some notion that even economists are uh, trying to be aware of this distinction. So if you look at what I call the trilogy of Balras, Henry, George, and Thibault, I don't know whether you all know Thibault's model, but uh, the idea basically is that uh, if you, you, can, you can allow markets to do their job if you assign some part of the economy to be social. So in the case of Balras and Henry, George, and Thibault in an indirect way, that which has to be social is land. 
and someone mentioned Thomas Paine, you know, he too, at some stage, says all these, what he called natural assets, as opposed to artificial assets, they should be owned by the collective. So by giving the society a certain part of the economy, uh, I can actually leave aside the private part of the economy as long, as long as I have enough economics for the society to work with. But notice something very important, because nowadays we also have public economics. But how do we do public economics? We always ask, is this efficient? Why? Since when is an efficiency an ethical criteria? Why should the public domain should be run according to the same criteria we run the private domain? Uh, <clears throat> the other method is called Robinson Wicksteed, which basically is, such, of course, Robinson is one of the official fathers of the separation of ethics from economics by actually claiming that economics is value free. And he was following Wicksteed, who was the English Austrian, uh, by saying, look, the only thing we have to worry about is creating plenty. Then society can do whatever it wants. So why don't we first create plenty and then let society do what it wants? Sounds very attractive, except if you ask yourself the question, is the creation of plenty is something society really wants? And is the process, the way in which we create it, is something society may approve of? Now, the two welfare theorems and the Keynesianism and welfareism are what I call correctionism. It comes from Pigou. So those people who say, well, we need to introduce some ethical criteria, what they are saying here, let's have natural liberty, but let's tweak in it, correct it a little bit so it fits the story we want. At the end of the day, none of them denies that the system of natural liberty actually can work. They may say it doesn't always work and say well, it can work as a matter of principle. Now, <clears throat> uh, so all of these theories, which are of course based on methodological individualism, and I'm not departing now from methodological individualism, although the comment someone made earlier, which is, is relevant, uh, you know, I do think that economics has to think more in terms of Because thermodynamics uh, actually creates a process in which, of course, temperature changes. And when it changes, the particle behaves very differently. So you have a sort of kind of a recursive system that actually feeds into itself, which act I think that the classical theory is like this. And hopefully, I will get there to tell you about this. But it doesn't look promising, I can tell you now. OK, so, uh, so evidently, whatever, because it is methodological individualism, and because it begins, therefore, for the individual, any statement we want to make about separation of ethics from economics or a relationship about them has to be based on the way we perceive the, the individual, the way the individual sees his or her own social role and they see society. So uh, in other words, it depends on the sociality attributes or, that we give to individuals. So here, I have to wander to further field. And I'm wandering to a wonderful field called evolutionary biology and anthropology. No, I reject that. <laughs> this is the, I'm, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so um, why is it, it, it is a wonderful field really actually. So one of the things we all know of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Darwin's edict of the fit, individual fitness, which is also used by others who talk about the selfish gene and things like this, which economists found, oh look, the, Actually, the system of nature is like the system of economics. But of course, this is all false. Because there's, there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that the individual behaves differently. And the, in, in, in evolutionary biology, there's a new concept, new from the 60s, devised by Hamilton, which is called inclusive fitness. Now, inclusive fitness works on a very simple principle. Uh, it means that if the cost to the actor of an action is less than the benefit to someone else and the relationship between those two people is strong, then the agent will actually do it. Which means you may conduct a completely selfless act. And some examples of some kind of squirrels that is even life and threatening because these squirrels would warn the others even though the actual action of warning exposes them to the penalty. So there are, and there's a lot of evidence for this in the world of nature. So if you want to broaden the question, 
in, in the, the fact that there are social acts among groups, and if we accept what is no, well known for uh, uh, um, any anthropologist, that humans have always lived in groups, the question is, can we try and understand these social actions? And I'm proposing here two criteria by which to measure them. One, by the, incent by the motive behind this. Is the motive of a social act selfish? For instance, well-known fish you know, are in school. But they have absolutely no other purpose in being in the school than to preserve themselves. They're in their school because that's good for me. You know, it's not good for the school. They don't care about the school. Uh, so from a selfish motive to a social motive like that squirrel, which I had mentioned earlier. And the other aspect I'm talking about is whether it is an instinctive act or a cognitive act. Because one thing which is typical of uh, human uh, development. I don't know whether you're familiar with literature about the social uh, brain. So one of the things in lots of testing of evolutionary theories, um, so uh, the, of course, the size of the, of the brain of hominids, of human sapiens, has, the size of hominids in general increased over the 4,500, 4.5 million years. So that doesn't tell us a great deal. So what does matter is actually the composition of the brain. So here we talk about the distinct difference between the medulla, which is responsible to the uh, physiological active, and the neocortex. And what they've discovered, that if in some kind of comparative neurology, they've discovered that the only thing which is correlated with the, si the relative size of the neocortex in the brain is the size of the social group. Nothing else is correlated with it, which means that the purpose, the evolutionary purpose, of cognition was really to enlarge the social group. So that means that any kind of incentive to action can come from the cognitive side and not necessarily from the instinctive one. In any case, again, because uh, I, okay, we have therefore four categories. So we have this category in which people conduct social action like the fish for the reasons of selfish motivation and instinctively. So I call it mechanical functionality which is consistent with the Darwinian concept of individual fitness. Okay, so that's, I, I use a term that, Dal, that uh, 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 Durkheim used, but Durkheim used mechanical solidarity, so I'm gonna separate. This is mechanical, so society as a mechanical function. The other group in which you still have, like the squirrels, you still have an instinctive act, but with a social motive, I call it a naturally organic society, and that corresponds to the Hamiltonian concept of inclusive fitness. Now we move up to the cognitive element, which is probably where we're going to find human. So where do we have, what do we have here? We have on this side those people who think that individuals are self-interested or selfish, and they, act, they choose to act socially for a cognitive purpose. These are cognitive functional societies. Society actually exists to serve the interest of the individual. This is very much the line behind Locke. Well, Locke that is not aware of the fact that the state of nature is already a social state. Okay? So that, that is more or less corresponding to this, although you'll find Locke's in somewhere else. And the other case, of course, where people actually look at society as a natural phenomena and as part of their cognitive development, that is what I call a cognitive organic society. So in a sense, by the way, uh, you can look at Hume, uh, all the Scottish Enlightenment, where evolutionaries, in a sense, they always understood society as, as a natural thing for human which is evolving. Uh, now, if you want to locate figures, so of course, Hobbes is entirely that, and people are enormously selfish, that they enter society in order to protect themselves. Here we have Spencer, who is, um, I know he's a bit sort of, uh, we're unsure about him, he talks about the egotistic motive, but he also says before the egotistic motive there is some kind of cooperative uh, desire. So I put Spencer further, there on the border, he's undecided. Equally, Durkheim is a bit undecided, he has this solid, uh, mechanical solidarity which he assumed everybody has before they are even aware of themselves. So in a sense, he's slightly on this edge. And uh, of course, Locke, the Locke that thinks that the state of nature is the state of nature, who really thinks society is the creation of humans in order to achieve something in addition. But where would you find economics in all that? Well, classic economics is categorically here. All classical economists 
perceived society is a natural phenomenon. And for all of them, it's a phenomenon that precedes the question of economic organization. And as I know, I'm not going to get there, because of you. <laughs> uh, I can tell you now that uh, in Adam Smith, the motive behind everything is a social drive to be socially recognized. That's what people see only. And everything else is a manifestation of that, which is quite interesting. So maybe you should give me more time. <laughs> Modern economics is a Hobbesian world. It's a world of selfish people who exploit society for their own purposes. That's where modern economics is. Now, what does evolution tell us, given what I said about the social brain? What does evolution tell us about the development of humanity? Well, evolution tells us that this is the direction in which humanity goes. As the neocortex increased over four, five, four and a half million years, actually most of it happened more recently, that we are moving up from the instinctive level of sociality to a cognitive one. The, this, of course, is true to some animals, like fish, and, or not, they don't have cognition. So some animals may have made of, I don't know, this is a hypothesis. What I call the betrayal is this. And this is what modern economics has done. They have taken this line and diverted it into something which is totally nonsense. It is not related neither to our understanding of evolution or nor our understanding of human beings. So, so as I said, the, the choice of AIDS, uh, okay. And the first betrayal, which I don't want to, <coughs> which I will skip now, is the fact that even within the natural liberty model, we're actually not getting what we want. Uh, uh, the reason, uh, okay, we don't get what we want, so I'll skip that. So let's talk about what are the implications of the fact that we defined human sociality in the way we did in that category over there, what is the implication of it from the way we theorize about society? Well, here are two structures, the classical and the neoclassical. The classical, because we're still maintaining the methodological individual. So in that sense, we start with the individual. From the individual, we get society. That's what I call the Smith case, that we all want to plead, we want to get social uh, recognition and so on and so forth. So we begin with persuasion, and we end up with division of labor, which I'll explain a bit later. Uh, so, but because we've created society, we have already created ethics, which means we've created ethics before we create economy. What is the modern story? The modern story is exactly, we have individuals, they want to get what they want, well, society is an after, ethics is an afterthought. Yeah, they may like it, they may not like it, they will tweak it, they will do, they will do redistribution, they'll do various things, all to get what they want, but it's an afterthought. Don't touch my economy. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so what is the implication of it to the distinction between the social and the private individual? So here's a short story. Imagine two individuals, and they have the following skills. One is wine tasting. So they have two, uh, commodi uh, two commodities, wine tasting, three, the wine tasting and sewage shifting. These are the two activities in the economy. And of course, individual, one of the individual, this is uh, wine tasting, this is sewage shifting. So this is, the, as you know, comparative static. We know that modern economics says these two individuals want to get more of everything, so they will combine. These are their comparative uh, advantage. So here's the society that create going all the way here. And they will end up at point EA, because here we have total, complete specialization. And they're going to be happy. And that we know in economics how to get for a day. How? Competitive centralization. Economics tells us competitive centralization will lead us to a point like A. Wonderful. Once they're at A, all of a sudden, the one who works in the sewage shifting all day sees the other one sitting in the balcony and shifts, tasting wine where they make some uh, cheese. So, why am I doing this and you're sitting over there? All of, so, economics doesn't recognize this. Because Robinson Crusoe, before he meets private, has exactly the same objective after he meets private. So these two individuals, if they had no other objective, because they met each other, they'll stick to A. But if they came together and they discovered that there are social relations, 
that there are some things that did not exist in the state of nature, namely the question of distribution of burden. And all of a sudden, it's another factor we haven't thought about. Oh, so you say, okay. So if you think about this is the extreme of equal burden, in which case, by the way, they will not specialize at all. And this is the case of total inequality. So this is the equity principle, this is the efficiency principle. Now, of course, modern economics says, I found a solution, we had say, we have this, uh, the second best principle, <coughs> we will take away from the efficient as long as social welfare function allows us. And my question is, why? Why not ask the question exactly the opposite way? <coughs> we want equity, and we're willing to forego equity as long as our moral principles are willing to sustain it. So that's a very different way of asking the same question. But one thing is clear. Whatever point we choose in between A and D, markets will never take us there. So the idea of natural liberty as a solution to the social economic problem, no, it isn't. And it's by the judgment of economics itself we will not get this point here. So this is a more general description of it. Okay, so, so we may ask, is modern economics a social theory at all? Does it actually take into consideration a society? So, uh, well, I mentioned about these things, okay, okay. By the way, it's interesting because Locke, of course, thought that natural liberty will solve all the problem. When Hume, Hume write about natural liberty, he's more circumspect. He says, well, you know, if I think about commerce and trade, history teaches me, if he was very keen on history, that natural liberty is a good way of all But when I think about culture and education, hmm, I'm not sure. So already Hume, who is considered by a lot of people the father of this kind of, he said, mm, I'm not sure it works in this. It doesn't work in what actually may matter more, culture and education, which also, of course, corresponds to the bits of John Stuart Mill no one reads because it's on page 900. So, of course, in Mill's story, if you remember, what is the ideal future? The ideal future is stagnation. Because his belief was that in the process of education, in the process which we go in which we become more educated and conscious of our environment, people will develop more cooperative tendencies. This will lead to more cooperative form of organization. And then we will achieve so much material well-being that it will be enough for us to spend more time on what matters most. Okay. So, uh, so, this is the, so the question is, so modern economics says, oh, look, this is all nothing to do with me, that has to do with the rationality of the agents, as people criticize correctly. But what is this rationality, and how does this connect to the way we conceive human sociality? Oops. Well, a lot of people quote Weber on, on rationality, but Weber actually had two, if not three. I'll two, no, well, he talks about two four motives, but Two are clearly have the word rationality in them. One, of course, it's Zweckrationalität, and the second one is Wertrationalität. So the uh, translation in English is, woeful as it may be, Zweckrationalität is what we call instrumental rationality, and, uh, which basically means to choose the best means to an end. And Wertrationalität means, well, forg forgive me, the umlaut is not there, because uh, Wertrationalität actually means that I have chosen rationally a value which I think is so important that it overrides other principles, and I know how to act according to that value. I will show you how, what that means. So, by the way, in simple looking, looking at evidence, now I know this is not, I'm not an experimental economist, so I will not claim to this to be any evidence of anything, but some indication, a feel of it. When this is from the World Value Survey, so people are asked, what motivates them to act? So it's self-declared, so I don't know how true it is. But this, we can see if they're looking at the self-declaration, success is important, which is the Zweck rationalität perspective. I want to choose the best means. Apparently, very, very few people think that this is important. But if you ask me whether it's behaving properly, namely behaving according to the edict of ethics, Zweck rationalität, look how many. So or if you take this one, these are probably the majority. So it is clearly that at least in the mind of individual, and I'm not saying that this is a proof that they actually behave like this, but at least in the mind of individual, it's more important to them, as Adam Smith recognized, to be socially right, 
to act according to what is ethically right. So how does it appear? So if we have now, so I'm trying to put them all in one framework so it makes sense of it. Uh, so in, what is, on, this, on this line here, I'm talking about the domain of consideration. What I mean by this, in simple terms, is what do you put as an argument of your daily functions? At this, at this here, I'm looking at the level of interest you have in the others. So what would instrumental rationality be? Well, the selfish story we know. We don't care about the other, and we don't take into consideration any effect of our actions on the other. But in principle, we can think of a very socially minded individual who cares a lot about the other, and therefore any action he or she takes, they will take into consideration the effect of the rational of everybody. Now, <laughs> this is impossible. Not only that it's impossible, I can prove, and I do it in the book, but I'm not doing it now, that even in the middle here, using utility as a representation of the preferences of individuals, will lead to a ridiculous outcome. In other words, you cannot actually get an individual doing all these calculations using the apparatus the way an economist want to represent rationality. So let's suppose individuals are this rational. So one thing, what may drive them into this position here? Apart from the fact that this is not, there's no mechanism of doing it. I can't consider the effect of my action on so many people or so many things. So how can I, what, does this move mean? This move mean that I still care about the others and I act in a way, I'm not calculating the outcomes of my action. I'm using some kind of a Kantian universal rule, if you wish. I'm saying to myself, if everybody did A, their outcome would be good, therefore I do A. I don't know whether this A I'm doing now is good or not, but I know that the principle it is good, I'm following this kind of categorical imperative. In a sense, categorical imperative is this kind of expressive rationality. What is interesting about Smith is that he offers us a story about why we get there. And the story he offers us, I'm a, okay? <laughs> One minute, okay. <clears throat> so here is the story he tells us. Uh, I'll just go straight to okay. As you know, in Adam Smith, uh, as I said, the first motive is to be <clears throat> is to be uh, uh, socially recognized. And the way we achieve social recognition is through the process of sympathy, which is the exchange of place with that person and the sense of harmony in which we get. However, Smith is conscious of the fact that this is very hard to do. And there is another source of harmony, utility. This is not the utility of economics. This utility is the beauty of things. So he says, lots of time I can look at the beautiful and, and say, wow, it gives me the kind of sense of harmony which people, he argues, tend to control us. And he tell, talks about people who may move to use this rather than sympathy as a way of judging whether things is good, are good or bad. Uh, nevertheless, they're conscious, if they really thought about it and they used, they're conscious, they really are trying to do this. They're emulating this story, but they're doing it in a false manner. Now, what can lead us, therefore, to this greater use of utility? Well, let's begin with division of labor. So when people divide, begin the beginning of division of labor, it's a story of sharing gifts. You know, and what you kind of gifts you give? If you're very good in, in, in creating errors, you'll create a bit more errors and give it as gifts to someone else, and other will exchange gifts, and soon you discover that you can all exchange gifts, and actually you can fulfill all your uh, life necessities by this exchange of gifts, so you specialize now in this. But as you become specialized, the number of people you depend on in order to achieve your social theory of subsistence increases. As the social boundary increases, you are now with people who you know less. And if you know them less, your ability to perform sympathy on them is reduced, because you can't put yourself in their shoes. So as you know them less, you move to greater use of utility. As you move greater utility comes in the deception of nature, which also tells us, this is the problem of the difference between the interest of nature and money. Nature says, no, 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 produce a lot of, good, a lot of material because that's good for the survival of the species. But individuals say, I don't want a lot of material. I want life of reflection and friendship, as Aristotle said. Nature says, forget about it. 
What more is there? That's, that's the evolutionary principle. So, uh, um, so what people say, how is it safe? So because I don't know the other people, how can I acquire their social approval? I buy a Porsche. <laughs> and if I buy a Porsche and they see me in a Porsche, they say, ooh, there goes a very good man. <laughs> so all of a sudden, what becomes, we have material well-being replaces social relationship. But as it replaces social relationship, it increases the division of labor. As it increases the division of labor, it increases the social distance, and we are on a very fast route into oblivion. Perhaps that's the point of view. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, there's more to tell, but I will just leave. This is, okay. Yeah. Let me, sorry, let me just summarize the conclusion. By, there's evidence to suggest that humans are social beings. This means that society precedes economic organization. This means that ethical principle precedes economic outcome. Rationality is more likely to be expressive. Competition is a reality. I'm not denying that. So you get, you, someone put the picture of, uh, of Life of Brian. Oh, uh, Brian, you did. I used to post the picture of a bazaar, and I said to students, is this a natural phenomenon? Say yes, They're, all societies had a bazaar. And then I put the picture of a trading floor in the stock market, and I'm asking, is this a natural phenomenon? Ah, no. So I'm asking, how did we get from this to that? Ah, because people looked at this natural phenomena and said it was good, and that's why they had the floor. And I'm saying, yes, competition and trade is a natural phenomenon, but so is Ebola. Do we go and spread Ebola because it's a natural phenomenon? Some natural phenomena need to be contained and restricted. So that's competition is a reality, but needs to be contained and subjugated to social purposes. Economic betrays us, offering, well, lie according to this natural liberty can provide solution to the economic problem. This is not true. And it betrayed, we betrayed it by actually ignoring human sociality. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there's uh, some room for uh, questions. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, fascinating. Just one clarificatory question. Uh, so, who is the we who betrayed economics? Uh, I, I, I don't exonerate myself. All of us who have done economics in the, uh, in the 20th century, basically. I think all, all of us from Marshall onward. Okay. Where, where, where do you put the heterodox economists? You I don't put them anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like these. these well, that's that's because you've left out a very significant group of people who don't fit into your argument. No, they don't. They do fit in my argument. I make a distinction between those people who criticize economic methods which I do not. And, uh, and I think the reason why economists, why the economic theory has been so resistant, because a lot of what the heterodox, heterodox economics is doing is criticizing economic method and economics don't want to hear about it, in my view, for good reasons. And therefore, it ends there. My criticism is within the uh, methodology of economics. I'm not departing from it. I'm within the methodology of economics and I prove them wrong from within. A lot of heterodox economists will say that their methodology is following a lot of the ideas that you're putting forward. And I would say they're wrong. Yes, but I will say you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Uh, uh, just uh, as a, uh, again, to clarify, what, what do you mean by economic organization? And what's day zero of economic organization? A economic organization is the way, the institutional arrangements, and I mean institutionally broadly, that you propose in order to resolve a particular economic problem. So I agree with you that what is an economic problem, I just didn't have time, and I don't have time to talk about it, is a question. But when I said that economists believe about the universalism of economic theory, one of the things they believe is universal <coughs> is the economic problem, the means to reduce, to actually reduce scarcity, to have as much as we can. This is neither in time nor in space universal. I fully agree with this. But within the, con within the context of the way you define an economic problem, there are institutional solutions. It's equally, by the way, when the Greeks, like Plato or even Aristotle, 
had an economic problem. They had an economic problem. But their economic problem was how to support the just society or the good state. So there were institutional recommendations that followed from it. So for me, the institutions are the derivative of the way you define economic problems. Yes. Any more questions? Uh, can I ask my second question? Uh, sorry, can you back to at the back? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, just a quick question about, um, you seem very resistant to the idea sorry. of the, um, you seem very resistant to the idea of there being social beings who act on, for social good. Did I understand you correctly? And I you're, that's why I didn't understand what you were saying, and obviously that's why I didn't understand you. Sorry, say again. No, I said, you seem very resistant to the idea that there's social beings that act in, in with a social purpose or social good. Um, did I understand you correctly? No, and, you didn't. Um, so please explain the part where you do speak about the idea that there are social beings who act socially, and then your idea... I you said all beings, almost all beings, that have this beings to act socially. But they act socially for different reasons. Some of this, they don't act socially out of selfish reason and out of instinct. Some of them act for, for a selfish reason out of cognitive reason. Some of them act socially of instinctly, and some of them act socially from cognitive reasons. And I said that the history of humanity, given what we know about the social brain and this literature, uh, this is comparative neuro neurology, uh, suggests to us that the path that humanity has gone is along the side of social motives that have been moved from instinctive to, to, uh, to uh, cognitive. So, yeah. I think we must bring this session to a close. Michael, do you want to make any announcements for tomorrow? I, I, I want to make a comment before I answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what, what, what you said about Alan Smith right at the beginning, that, well, it, it's reminiscent of what Carl used to say, and Isabella may confirm that. Um, what he said in class, and I think what he told Isabella as well, he was of the view that nothing new has been said in economics after Adam Smith. <laughs> well, I, 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 as you can see, I'm trying to elevate Adam Smith, but I wouldn't go, you know, some people say that the whole history of philosophy is footnotes on Plato. Yes. So, uh, I, okay. I, I don't have been able to go away with along with it, but I don't think it matters for the argument. But, yeah. Okay, we're going to bring the session to a close and we'll meet at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Yeah.